So if a customer goes someplace else, it's because you've given them a reason to go someplace else. They do not want to go someplace else. They don't have the time. They don't have the patience. What you need to do is you need to soothe that fatigue. Find the ways to recognize what their fatigue is. Find out where they are in their journey. Meet them where they're at in that journey and say, listen, I've got you from here. Helping you create loyal customers and loyal employees all through the power of simplicity. This is the Simple Brand Podcast, now heard around the world, including St. Valentin, Austria. I'm your host, Matt Lyles, and this week, I'm talking with Chris Wallace. Chris is the co-founder and president of Interview Group, a brand consultancy that helps organizations improve alignment between their frontline teams and their go-to-market strategies. Now look, when we want to better understand how to improve our customer experience, we tend to dive deep into our customer data. Sometimes that's voice of the customer research. Sometimes that's observing our customers. Sometimes that's analyzing customer behavior. But Chris shares an overlooked and untapped resource that can provide significant insights into your customers. And that's your frontline team members. Your frontline team members likely know your customers better than you do. They know your customers' goals. They know your customers' challenges. They know how your customer experience helps them. And they know where your customer experience falls short. Not only that, your front line is in the best position to deliver the message and narrative that you want your customers to hear beyond just your advertising. Chris and I talk about how to create a more collaborative relationship with your frontline team to get those insights. And we talk about curbing the disconnect that happens between leadership and the frontline and how to get your frontline to care more about your brand. So here it is. Here's my interview with Chris Wallace. Hi, Chris. Welcome to the show. Hello, Matt. Thanks for having me on today. Yeah, well, I'm excited to talk to you because I love the work that Interview does and I love your focus around the front line and frontline employees. So before we get into all the detailed questions, I'm curious, can you talk to me about your journey and how you got to where you've been inspired by the value of frontline employees? I, I think it, the, the journey starts with having been a frontline employee in a number of different roles. And by I say frontline, you know, the way we define frontline is really anybody that interfaces with a customer. Right. And it, it yeah. really, you know, it can be across a variety of industries, but anybody who interfaces with a customer, right? The people who actually serve the customers directly. And having been in sales the majority of my career and sometimes hybrid sales and marketing roles, I've carried a bag, literally in some cases, a bag with stuff in it that I was selling. And everybody else on my team has as well. So we've walked a mile in those shoes. And what we've just found over the years, and, and this is both from working with big brands as an employee and executive as well as on the consulting side has been just the struggle to take what the vision is at the corporate level in, in building out the go-to-market strategy and the customer strategy and getting the people out there at the front lines to say, you know what? I'm on board with that, right? Somewhere along the line, things get lost in translation and that doesn't happen. So, you know, we experienced that enough times and then saw it happening frequently in the organizations we were working with and said, That's, it's a niche, but we're going to make it our niche. Excellent. So when it comes to that overall vision and the path that it has to, well, that it has to cascade down to get to the front line, where do you see that breaking down? Where do you see that stopping? It's a variety of different places. One of the questions that we get asked all the time, and this is talking to executives, talking to, to leadership teams, they say, what if we're not aligned? What if the leadership Happens. team's not aligned? Is that something that you help with? Or is that something that's addressed? And the answer is we can, and, and we will address that. But I think a lot of times you start with some misalignment that's happening at the top. Uh, I honestly think that in terms of where the breakdown happens, I think a lot of times the struggle is for people to manage priorities. And the breakdown comes when you start getting down through the race, you start getting to frontline leaders and sales managers and things like that. And there's so many things that they need their teams to do and they need their people to be talking about or, or selling 
that they just, they don't even know which one's the most important. I think a lot of times what happens, honestly, simple stories get lost in translation because people are so overwhelmed that they think something's more complex than it really is. You almost need to break it back down for them and say, no, it really is this simple. This is really all you need to do. And that's where the light bulb goes on. So I think there's a lot of perceived, like this is going to be harder than it really is. And then when you break it down for them, people realize, oh, no, I can do this. That's not that hard. So a lot of it comes around the clarity around the vision, the clarity around what they should focus on. It's funny as you use the word clarity. We yeah. worked with a, a marketing partner very early on when we started interview. And one of the things that they told us was they said, you offer your clients clarity. Clarity is probably the most important thing that you offer your clients in terms of a benefit that you offer them. I think that that's well captured on your end. I do believe a lot of it comes down to clarity. Everybody needs it. Everyone needs clarity. And when you have that clarity, it's so much easier to do your job. No question. And I think that a lot of cases we'll have people say, and I don't want this to come across, this is not a a put down at all to frontline employees, but people will say, did this sound kind of like we're spoon feeding it to them? And what we say to them is, it is. It is spoon feeding to them. You, you, you've given them so many other things to think about that if you think at the complex level, and again, this goes right in with the theme of your show, right? Executives have a tendency to make things more complicated than they really are. Um, and that's why we say we're translators. We're translating this big, grandiose kind of vision and strategy into, well, we just need to go out and ask these couple of questions. We don't need you to do, we need to sell the entire thing. We don't need you to, it's not a one call close. It's, any of that, what we just need you to do is ask a couple of questions like, oh, I can do that. I, I didn't realize that's what you needed me to do. So yeah. that I, spoon feeding is not a put down. It's actually more a reflection of the complexity coming from leadership. But we do that. We do that translation. We, we spoon feed it and people are happy to have it spoon fed. It makes it easier for them. I would have to think that if it's spoon fed to them, if it's simplified for them, then that frees up some of their brain space to be able to say, oh, OK. Here's what I can do. Here's how I can put my personality into it based on all this information that I know. Yeah. And you know how we, get, how we do that? We ask them. Oh. We give them the simplified version and we say, how could you take this? I mean, you literally just sort of summed up our change strategy, which is if you want somebody to do something, give them a concept, ask yeah. them to think critically about it, come up with their own ideas and attach their own solutions to it. And the next thing you know, it's their idea, right? You're making it their idea. So involving them in the process and asking them, how would you do this? How would you, oh, well, my customers don't want to talk about it this way. I think I'd have much more luck talking about it like this. Well, if it accomplishes what you need to accomplish and you believe it puts it into the voice that's comfortable for you and and makes it relevant for your customer, what power to you? That's why we don't believe in scripts. We don't ever give sales scripts or anything like that. Nobody's going to go in and read a script. And by the way, 90% of the people you'd read it to, it, it, it's not going to hit the mark with. So we've only been putting it into context for people. I would have to think that that helps them feel more empowered. It helps them feel like they have more ownership in their role and ownership in their work and what they're delivering to the customer on a one-on-one basis. If it happens with them, right? If, if Think about, and I, I say it, if it happens, We're talking about product rollouts, customer experience programs, promotions, new pricing and packaging, all of the things that marketers and and, and product teams are trying to get to market. What we're trying to do is say, if, if you want it, if you want those things to be successful, if you want adoption for those things, involving people in that process and, and helping integrate it into their mind by, by asking instead of just always telling. Um, th- like you said, the buying and adoption you get is, is significantly higher. And if you can involve them early enough in the process, they're going to help you make sure that you get it right the first time instead of you just taking it to 90, 95, 99% completion and then lobbing it over the wall at them and say, here you go, run with it. And they say, this doesn't work for us at all. And here's why. Yeah, exactly right. And I think there's a lot of assumptions that are made, right? Like you, yeah. you may, people make a lot of assumptions. And I think that what informs those assumptions is a big part of the work that we do. And I'm sure we'll get into that more, but making sure that assumptions and biases that people at corporate have don't find their way into job aids. The key here to this whole thing, Matt, is 
organizations need to realize that their frontline teams, their sales teams, whoever it is that's out there at the front lines, they can decide what they talk about and don't talk about. They can decide what they want to say and what they don't want to say. If you think it's any other way, then you're fooling yourself. You're fooling yourself. You're not going to lay off half of your frontline team because they didn't sell your new product. They can decide whether or not they want to talk about it. Our goal is to get them to want to talk about it. Let's get them to the point where they not just understand, but they actually believe in the message that's being delivered and they want to get behind it. They want to evangelize it. It's a higher bar. And that that's where the struggle comes in is we're recognizing that we're setting a higher bar for organizations, but when they keep falling below their own expectations and their own results and their own performance, we look at it as don't keep doing the same thing over and over again. Raise the bar and let's do it better. There you go. So when it comes to helping your frontline employees become evangelists, what's the key to that? How do you help them do that? We talk a lot in interview about belief, confidence, and pride. Okay. We've developed a, a tool called In Front, which is yeah. essentially market research. It's a sentiment analysis, for lack of a better phrase, but it's frontline research that we do that looks a lot like consumer market research. Right. You're going out and finding out what your consumers think about you and help, you know, really assessing what they think of your value proposition. Well, we do the same thing with your frontline teams. So what we're doing is we're not asking them what they know. We're asking them what they believe. What do you believe? What do you believe about the product? Where do you believe it excels? Where do you believe that it's falling short? How do you think overall you are delivering, you know, on the promise that, that your company makes to the customers? If you want to know where they stand, you, you've got to quantify it in some way. So. We, we are taking what a lot of times would be done via focus grouping or, and things, or ride outs and things like that. And we've turned it into a scalable feedback mechanism that can help organizations understand where their people, really what their mindset is at all times. Right? Are they bought into this? Yes or no. And if they're not, why not? And so part of that is being able to understand and capture all that information, capture that sentiment, capture their beliefs. Once you've got all that information, once you've got the information, the data, then what do you do with that to actually put that into action? Let me give you an example from a recent client. The great thing about doing this in a quantitative way is you can pick different metrics from, from our study and we can say, here's a number we'd like to see move. The perception is, and I'll give you a re recent client example. I won't say who it is, but they have a communications product. They have a mobile product okay. and their mobile product, the perception around their coverage and their network is not where it needs to be related to the competition. Right. Well, the reality is that they actually are on the same network as one of their competitors. It, it's the same exact mobile network. Wow. And what we found was there was perception that our network doesn't stack up in the marketplace when they just simply don't know. There, there's, there's a misconception. We've identified, we have quantified a misconception. And what we can do going forward is say, that number is here. You are nine points below a competitor that actually has the same technology. They have the same technological offering that you do. We need to make your teams aware of that and, and give them the talking points to be able to share that in an appropriate way and let people know that you do stack up. And if we do that effectively, guess what? We're going to see that number move. So we are going through and we are pinpointing specific things about the value proposition that we believe the frontline perception needs to be dialed up on. And then we make recommendations on how are you going to reach your front lines? How are you going to message this? What are some creative ways you can get the content back out to them? You're trying to change their mind. You're not trying to just inform them of something. You're really trying to change their mind. So right. we encourage them to be creative. But that's an instance that we have pinpointed one specific thing that is hurting their confidence in front of customers. They are misinformed. We've got to make sure that we convince them that, no, 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 we are up to par with the marketplace on this. We got to see that number move. When you talk about changing their mind, you're not saying necessarily just changing the customer's mind, but changing the actual frontline team members' minds too. So I'm glad you asked right. the question that way, Matt, because the way we look at it is there's no better way to influence a customer than to influence the person talking to the customer. Marketers set the expectation for the customer. Marketers are in the demand generation business, right? They set expectations. Demand shows up, but the loop has to be closed. Dem demand does not equate to new relationships or closed sales or conversion, whatever you want to say. We look at it as 
the person, and, and this is not in every instance, but in many industries, in many instances, the person serving that customer has the ability to impact their buying decision significantly. And we have research in different industries where it's as high as like 86% of the time, the, the decision the customer makes is driven by the, per, the salesperson that they're talking to. So if you agree that the frontline team member has influence over the customer, then focusing on winning them over is a, a high leverage proposition. Yeah, that only makes sense. And you talk about it from the perspective of winning over a customer, likely new customers, customer acquisition. But what about when it comes to customer retention and focusing on existing customers? <laughs> that, that, that's a tricky dance, right? When we think about the retention side of things, the brand and the customer experience and the way that that all, that all comes together, really defining what those touch points are, needs to be consistent throughout. You really need to have a consistency in the way that people are engaged. We see this in the banking industry a lot. The banking industry is always thinking about most of their opportunity comes from existing customers, not new customers, right? So that's actually a lot, a lot of brands, a lot of companies, but in the banking industry in particular, they have to grow through their existing customers. So figuring out the way to deliver the right experience, the right balance between selling and service and striking that sales service balance, yeah. it's, it's tricky and it's delicate, but if they're going to grow, they have to figure it out. The, the good ones really understand and it can help their people see that there are times when selling to a customer is the best form of service you can deliver. If they need something that they don't currently have, and it's going to make their situation better. And you can explain how it makes your situation better. You're doing them a disservice not to position products and services to them. And we've seen that through research in the banking industry that that's what consumers want. Consumers want, they actually want you to recommend things. They want you to do it the right way, but they want you right. recommending. So that balance between I'm looking out for you and I'm serving you versus I'm trying to sell you something, that's a, that's a delicate balance. Yeah. And customers, I, I think a lot of times when it comes to, the products and the services that you offer that they would need. A lot of times like, customers don't know what they don't know as far as all the available services. It depends on what you're talking about. And I, I want to be clear for your listeners that okay. we, we don't work with consumer packaged goods, for example. If it's something you can walk into a CVS or a Walgreens or a Rite Aid and pick up off the shelf and take up to the register, we're not expecting that that person behind the register is going to do a thorough needs analysis on, on the shampoo, right? It's a, it's a little bit different, but w when, there's, when there's a human-aided portion to the conversation, what we find is, and it's everything from mobile and wireless services to the home improvement products and things like that, and your know, clients that we work with in that industry, that people simply are overwhelmed with the amount of choice that they have. They're not sure which route to go. And the, the, the holy grail across all those industries right now, including banking, is advice. People delivering advice in a way that does not come across as salesy is really where most organizations are going. They need people to be that advisor to their customers and do it in an effective needs-based, value-based way. And here we are in 2023, a lot of organizations still struggle to do that. I can see that. And as it relates to products, products that you can actually get off the shelf, whether it's a home improvement store or whatever else, a lot of times there's the opportunity for us to just go and grab it online from wherever we own. So a lot of people, customers, they're looking for that level of advice. They're looking for consultation. Here's my problem. Help me understand what's right for me. Yeah. And, and I think you, you listen to, to sales experts and things like that. They'll talk about how the consumer has so much more information today than they did 15, 20, 25 years ago. And that is absolutely true. I truly believe, and I think this actually even have this happened pre pandemic, that the average consumer crossed over from the point where they had too little information to they have too much information. There's too many sources. They're overwhelmed with. I'm just not sure where I need to go. There's 50 choices, 50 brands for anything that I could ever concept of wanting. I just need somebody to figure it out for me. I've been in that boat. And there's been times I've bought things where I've said to somebody, like, I want you to tell me what I need because you're the expert. Connect the dots for me. We're getting fatigued by the amount of information and by the amount of 
decisions that we're able to make based on products and whatever we're looking for. And I think a lot of time when customers get decision fatigue, they just throw their hands up and just walk away. The clients that we're working with right now, that's such a big part of the mindset that we're trying to put their people in, which is if a customer goes someplace else, it's because you've given them a reason to go someplace else. They do not want to go someplace else. They don't have the time. They don't have the patience. What you need to do is you need to soothe that fatigue. Find the ways to recognize what their fatigue is. Find out where they are in their journey. Meet them where they're at in that journey and say, listen, I've got you from here. I'm not going to make you go over ground that you've already covered so far. Let's figure out how to take you from the point you're at right now to the point of completion. The people, the, the companies, the brands, and this could be retailers, it could be call centers, it could be, you know, it, it really doesn't matter what that touch point is. If you can identify what that fatigue is and try to make their life easier, you're going to win. Yeah. My perspective, when it comes to delivering a customer experience, the best customer experience makes a customer's life easier. Yeah. In ways they don't even know how to ask for, right? Like in a lot of cases, they don't even know how to ask for it, but you're anticipating and you're giving them an easier experience. That aligns everything that we're doing. We have a retail client right now. They're overwhelmed. The assumption is, oh, well, they're going to price shop us and they're going to go someplace else. I'm like, they don't want to go anywhere else. They'll accept your price if you give them no reason to walk out that door. Don't give them a reason. Right, right. Well, so we've talked about customer experience. We've talked about vision and maybe vision as it relates to like the overall brand and how that may or may not cascade to the front line. So I'm curious how you see customer experience tying to the overall brand and tying to the overall culture of a company. We often talk about uh, the idea of the, the brand being the promise or the promises that you make to the right. customers, right? right. We, we are going to tell you we can do X, Y, and Z, and then you show up, okay? Because it sounds good to you, right? What we're saying we can do sounds good to you, or you like the, the, the image or you like whatever. There's a promise of something that you get from a brand. Customer experience is the operationalizing that promise and actually ensuring you can keep it. Brand makes the promise. Customer experience has to keep it. If you have misalignment between your brand and your customer experience, you've got a real problem. They should be synonymous. And with the best brands, they are synonymous, right? What you expect and what you get when you show up are very congruent. The very best brands do that. Organizations need to strive for that. Well, then what happens if there is that breakdown? What happens if here's the promise, here's the experience, and they're not quite connecting? What usually causes that? There's a couple paths I could take this down, okay? We did a study recently, uh, one of our in-front studies, and we have data that tells us that what is happening is if the organization is not delivering on the promise to the customer, they lose the faith of their frontline teams. If they lose the faith in their frontline teams who serve their customers, you're always on the defensive. If, if you're going to make promises and tell customers you can deliver something for them that you are consistently underperforming on, you lose your people. And when you lose your people, think about trying to get that back because they're the ones taking the, 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 the enemy fighter, so to speak, from the customers around some of these challenges. So if, if you're telling your customers you can do things that you actually can't, I actually think it's harder to win back your own people than it is to win back the customers. But you need your people more, right? You need to say, yeah. no, no, no. I know we had a hiccup on that, but we've made strides to address that. Or you need those people projecting confidence to the customers or turning that tide is really, really hard. So I think a lot of times where the breakdown is happening is organizations not recognizing that it's not just the customers losing faith in them, it's their people losing faith in them. And that is more insidious. That's a harder ship to turn. Oh, that makes sense. Absolutely. That also speaks to the fact that employee experience is tied directly to the customer experience as well. It definitely is. You know, we, we talk about that a lot in terms of the connection between employee experience and customer experience. And my company, my partners and I, our simple take is people that are in customer facing roles, if they're put in a position to succeed, that's what they want. That's the experience they want. They want to feel like they're doing good work. They want to feel like they can deliver for their customer. It bothers them. And this is something we've seen. 
we're probably into the seven figures globally of working with frontline teams. And what we see consistently is they just want to do a good job. They just want the customer to be happy. And if you put them in a position to make the customer happy, guess what? They're going to be happy. They're going to feel satisfied in their role. If you line them up in front of the firing squad because you're falling short on, on too many of the promises you make to the customer, they get beat down. I mean, how many times have we seen that, you know, whether it's people in a call center, people in a retail store, wherever, they, they get beat down. So if you can't deliver and you're making promises you can't keep, they're the ones who have to defend you. And that gets exhausting. And I would think that they want to be able to be set up for success, set up to be able to deliver for the customer. But I think at the same time, they also want to be able to do that without having to jump through too many hurdles. We talked earlier about making the customer's life easier. At the same time, I think there's something to be said. There's something valuable for ensuring that our frontline employees' lives, their jobs are easy for them to be able to, su to succeed for the customer. And no, there's no question about it. I had that conversation with the chief revenue officer of a, of a large consumer brand today. And hats off to him. He's bought in. He sees that that is an important thing. But companies with a good CX strategy and good CX leaders are going to make that happen, right? You can't say, well, this is going to be simple for the customer. And behind the scenes, it's bubble gum and duct tape. It, it cannot be that. Yeah. Systems and processes behind the scenes drive so many challenges for frontline associates. That's the stuff that needs to get cleaned up. Yeah. That's not sustainable on the long term. But I'm hearing this from some others, at least. It sounds like today, where we are 2023, it sounds like there are a number of brands that are starting to cut back, pull back on customer experience investment. Much of it sounds like it's hard for them to be able to measure the return, measure the results in customer experience. So I'm curious, what's your response to that? So you and I, did, did, we had a little sidebar conversation. I talked about you know, some of the trends that we were seeing. And I think that this is a trend. And, and I would agree with that, that I'm starting to see some of those investments get questioned. We're not going to solve the hard problems inside companies and, and solve customer problems without courage. If organizations don't have the courage to take on some of the, like the real challenges, like I'm not talking about buying a new piece of software, a new technology that sort of slaps a bandaid and you know, pays lip service to something. I really do think that organizations need to have courage to address some of these big problems because their people are suffering, their customers are suffering, and it, it comes down to well, we don't have an, we don't have the dollars to invest in driving a great experience for our customers. I look at it and say, do you want to continue to drive demand and try to get customers to show up if you can't back it up? You're doing more harm to your brand through that process than you are by maybe cutting back some of those investments. So I look at it as if you're not ready to serve the customer, be careful what you tell them and how much you spend to tell it to them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like whatever you're putting towards marketing to drive customers, to drive demand, to drive acquisition, how much of that could be put back into the experience to make sure that the experience lines up with what you're telling them? Exactly right. In a, in a world of finite budgets, those are the hard conversations I think organizations need to have. But cutting out CX investments or cutting them back to the bone is not the path to long-term customer equity. And at the same time, I do see brands putting some investment in CX, putting a lot more investment into technology and digital experiences. So I'm curious, what can we do to make sure that we're balancing technology, we're balancing digital experiences with the human touch of the front line. That's my biggest concern as it relates to customer experience. And I had a conversation with somebody yesterday about this coming from the banking space. Her take was the same as mine, that in some cases, the technology becomes the shiny object. And it's, yeah. it's an investment that's made sort of under the umbrella of, well, this is a customer experience investment. But the human aspect gets neglected because sometimes it's just easier to buy a new piece of technology, right? The roll up your sleeves, do the human part of it. I also think one of the trends that we're seeing, Matt, is there's question marks about how much to invest in frontline teams, given the turnover that they're seeing. So the, like, why would I invest if I'm seeing the type of turnover and these people aren't going to be there? I would argue 
you're going to continue to have that turnover unless you invest in your frontline team. So it really is a chicken or the egg. But we are definitely seeing a trend line of sort of raising the eyebrow saying, if I'm turning these people over at this type of rate, I'm not going to make much of an investment in them. So it's, again, those are tricky balances to strike for organizations. At the end of the day, you, it, it, can't, it can't be all or nothing. It can't be, we're just going to invest in technology. It has to be, how is the technology enabling the human experience? Because at the end of the day, the human experience is going to trump all, at least in the industries that we work in. The human experience will trump all. That is the opportunity to make that lasting connection with the customer. That's it. And you said something that, that's so key right there. The idea, the focus should be that the technology should be there to enable the human experience. That's for sure. All right. Well, Chris, I've loved this. I've loved all the questions you've been able to answer. I've got one, one last question for you. Okay. If you were to create a five song playlist for your work, what songs would you include? Five song playlist. Okay. So you're striking a nerve here, Matt, because <laughs> my team at Interview and I are, we're big music fans. Uh, and I am too. We're huge music fans and we've taken our team out. We've done concerts as a team and things like that. So it's I want to know more for you fabric. now. Yeah, it's woven in the fabric of, of our business. So I'll, I'll share the song. So the most story that I will tell, it will be about the first song. So during the pandemic, we actually recognized our team was struggling. Our clients were all struggling. We're like, people need a little bit of a jolt. Somebody threw out the idea of what if we hosted like a, a concert? What if we got like hired a musician to come and play a few songs? It's sort of like a virtual happy hour. So we took that from like hiring a local neighborhood acoustic guitar guy to we got introduced to, are you familiar with the Head and the Heart? Do you know the band, the Head and the Heart? Yes, yes, yes. Wow. So we got introduced to the Head and the Heart and we hired John Russell from the Head and the Heart to play a private streaming concert for our clients. It was invite only clients and friends and things like that. So uh, the Head and the Heart is our house band. The, the Head and the Heart, is, they, they are like our house band. And we just went and saw, all saw them live together for the first time here in Philadelphia. So Down in the Valley by the Head and the Heart is going to be our lead off song. Oh. Not because it relates to our work so much, but just because we love that band. And it's one of our favorite songs by that band. Second song, Midnight Train to Georgia. Gladys Knight and the Pips. Yeah, We have more clients in the state of Georgia than any other state. And we're a bunch cool. of Yankees from Philadelphia. So... <laughs> Not sure how that happened, but we've become sort of secondary citizens to the state of Georgia. So that second song, Inside Out by the band Spoon. We talk about Inside Out in terms of the way interview is our name. And we think about helping organizations market themselves from the inside out. So we thought that one would be appropriate. Low High by the Black Keys. Not only are a lot of people Black Keys fans, but we're entrepreneurs, right? We, we, run, a, we run a boutique consultancy. and Days have their lows and they have their highs, right? And, you know, in a business like ours, you have to try to modulate. But we thought that song was fitting. And then the last one is, and you're probably detecting a trend of the type of music that we all like, but Poem by Edward Sharp and the Magnetic Zeros. I don't know if you know that song, but um, we've moved our offices a couple of times. Okay. And as we've kind of navigated our way through COVID and where people work and things like that, we were always talking about like, what's our home base? What is home for us? But we actually just recently moved into a new office. So we have a new home at interview, a great new office that the team is enjoying. So home is a song that kind of embodies sort of the HQ, the headquarters place that we all congregate. So I'll go with that as the fifth. I love that. I, I love that playlist. And thanks for the explanation around those two. Oh, sure. Chris, I, I have learned a lot from you today, but where can people go to learn more? So uh, me personally, you can find me on LinkedIn, Curtis Wallace at Interview. And again, it's I-N-N-E-R-V-I-E-W, like taking an interview. Find me on LinkedIn. I'm in Philadelphia. Um, Chris Wallace is not an uncommon name on LinkedIn. So make sure you look for interview and make sure you look for the Philadelphia area. And then in terms of learning more about what we do, really everything kind of starts with our Infront Frontline Insights tool. Infrontinsights.com is the website for that. We have a great ebook, a downloadable ebook that talks about frontline insights, how to listen to your frontlines to learn about their perceptions around value proposition, your brand and things like that. So it's sort of a how-to guide, but feel free to check out Infront Insights and, and get that information. Excellent. And, and we'll, we'll link to that ebook in the show notes too. Well, great. Chris, thank you so much. I'm so grateful for your time today. Matt, thanks for having me on. It's been a lot of fun. 
I hope you enjoyed my discussion with Chris Wallace. You can learn more from him and interview at InfrontInsights.com. You'll find lots of resources and ways for interview to help you turn the voice of your front line into a key part of your marketing and customer experience strategy. And be sure and follow Chris on LinkedIn. He's always sharing his customer experience insights there. And if you're enjoying the Simple Brand Podcast, go ahead and hit the subscribe button. It's going to make it so much simpler for you to get future episodes like the next one featuring the king of clarity, Steve Woodruff. We'll be discussing lessons from his latest book, The Point, How to Win with Clarity-Fueled Communications. Listen, whether you're delivering a presentation, sending emails to your staff, coaching a team member, or even having a heart-to-heart with your spouse, If you want people to better understand you and to buy into your message, then this episode's for you. So go ahead and subscribe. You'll automatically get Steve's episode as soon as it's live. Until then, keep it simple. Simple.